This is Dick Weber. If you're a league or recreational bowler, I've got some very exciting news for you. The Dick Weber Legacy and the Legacy Reactive, two remarkable new bowling balls designed specifically to help you improve your game. AMF has adapted the advanced core designs of today's pro balls to help you create more hook and increase hitting power. If you're like many bowlers, that's just what you need to increase your score. If you're ready to move up to the next level of performance, go to your pro shop and ask for the Dick Weber Legacy or the Legacy Reactive from AMF. The first bowling balls in 25 years that I've wanted to put my name on. He has won 32 PBA events. One more. There it is. All the way home. Four times he's been named Bowler of the Year. Whoever throws, he comes, he's there, he cares. He is in the ABC Hall of Fame and the PBA Hall of Fame. He needs this one. All the way. All the way to the bank. A 10-time All-American. He was named all-time All-American by the Bowling Writers Association. Right He's a winner. He is the only professional bowler to win championships in five consecutive decades. He is the one and only Dick Weber. Hello, I'm Dick Weber. You know, it's been nearly 50 years since my first tournament victory. And I'm happy to say that bowling is as exciting for me as it's ever been. As a player on the senior tour, a PBA regional director, and a member of the AMF staff of champions, I've been able to be part of the continued development of the greatest sport in the world. But there's no role that I enjoy more than the one that allows me to share what I've learned in five decades of bowling, teaching people to be better bowlers. Since I started bowling, many aspects of the game have changed. Things like lane construction and finishes and the way oil dressings are applied have made bowling a somewhat different game from what it was 40 or 50 years ago. And especially in the last decade, ball technology has changed dramatically. Yet in spite of all these changes, many recreational and league bowlers have altered their playing styles very little from the basics they learned in their first months of bowling. Learning the basics is, of course, important. But even some of us veteran bowlers have had to go back now and then and revise some techniques we learned early on so we can continue to improve our games. So even though you're an experienced bowler and maybe even a very accomplished bowler, let's head for the lanes and see what you can do to make yourself an even better bowler. You know, a lot of people have referred to me as something of a textbook style bowler. And I think they mean that as a compliment. But no matter how good a teaching tool my style might be, there are many variations that also work well for many bowlers. To give you a better understanding of these variations and how they might be better for you, I've asked my friends, Leila Wagner, Steve Wunderlich, and Del Warren to help explain and demonstrate some of these alternatives. But first, let's look at the bowling ball itself. For anybody who enjoys bowling enough to want to be good at it, there comes a time when you need your own ball. And when that time comes, you have a lot of choices to make. First, let's consider the ball's surface material, its cover stock. For beginners and many other recreational bowlers, a polyester ball is an excellent choice. They are relatively low priced, and the bright colors and patterns of many of these balls have made them especially popular. As your skills become more advanced, you may want a ball that will allow you to create more hook. The surface of a urethane ball grips the lanes much better than a polyester ball, increasing its hooking potential and its carrying power as the ball hits the pins. Traditional urethane balls are also very durable. If you're a highly skilled bowler, the newer reactive urethane balls are a must. A ball made with reactive urethane cover stock will give you the greatest amount of hook and power available. But of course, the hook and power of these high-tech bowling balls depends on more than just the surface characteristics of the ball. Steve, we've talked about the cover stock on the outside of the ball, but what really goes on the inside of a bowling ball? 
Well, dig technology has changed dramatically since 1980. Prior to that, all the balls had traditional three-piece pancake weight blocks. And now we've made a lot of changes to create different rolls in the ball. The first change that was made was the small core two-piece ball. Later on, we had the big oversized core two-piece. Now we have the big inner outer core with an inner core also to change where the ball will break. And finally, we've taken all the things we've learned over the last 15 years and combined them into one ball. We took the traditional pancake three-piece ball, which gives us consistency and nice even reaction, and we combine that with the two-piece technology that gives us the big hook that everybody looks for today in your new Dick Weber Legacy Balls. Thanks very much, Steve, for that information. The polyester bowling ball, uh, it's been around for mm, maybe about 25 years and uh, it, it tends not to hook quite as much. It's a little more durable, um, but you do get some type of uh, uh, benefit from the bowling ball rather than the old hard rubber ball that we used to all know and love. Um, it's more like for the bowler, I think, that's a, a little more fashion conscious because it comes in a lot of different colors. Not so much for knocking down bowling pins. Uh, the urethane ball is, uh, uh, it costs a little more money, obviously, but you get a lot more performance out of the ball. Um, you don't have the, uh, uh, the color choice, but this is more for the bowler that wants to a little more serious. Maybe he bowls in two different leagues. Um, he's competitive. He wants to beat all his teammates, and uh, you're going to get a lot more hook out of this ball. And now, as far as the resin ball, that's probably the most exciting thing that's happened in bowling in a, you know, in a long time. Um, the ball hooks quite a bit more on the back end, um, and it's not so much the overall hook as it is the violent snap. And um, a lot of people love to see that ball hook, and because it snaps so much harder on the back end, the pins just um, race off the deck. And so um, it is, it's caused a lot of people to improve their game just by getting a new bowling ball, and uh, it's caused a lot more excitement in the game of bowling. I think the cover stock in the bowling ball has uh, really taken the game by storm. It's, it's helped a lot of women because it enables them to get uh, better carry. The plastic balls used to just slide longer and a woman has a tendency really not to turn the ball say as much as a man or get as many rotations so it's not going to grab the lane and hit as hard. If you get something that's going to grab the lane a little bit more with the cover stock of a urethane or even a resin now, uh, these balls have really, really helped an average bowler and especially a woman bowler. Uh, when I first started bowling there was the rubber balls and then it quickly went into polyester balls and they dominated the market through the 70s. In the early 80s came along urethane, which was more durable, had more hooking and hitting power than any ball prior to that. In the 90s, we have a new material. A, a resin has been added to the urethane to make it more reactive, to give more back ends, more hitting power, and is an absolute must for the high-performance bowlers. Uh, it's nice also because as we evolve with this material, we've been able to put it in mid-price balls for the everyday bowler to give them the opportunity to get that hitting power. For a player like me who doesn't throw a big hook, it's really a big advantage to have this material to get that big flip on the back end. So it's a great product. To sum up, having a ball that's right for your skill level and your size and strength is very important. And remember, the new ball designs aren't just for the pros. They may be just what you need to improve your own game. How you grip your bowling ball will have a major effect on your ability to control the ball's motion as it travels down the lane. Basically, there are two types of grip, the conventional and the fingertip. The conventional grip is best if you're a beginner or a recreational bowler. With the conventional grip, the ball is drilled so the middle finger and ring finger are placed into the holes up to the second joint. The thumb is placed all the way into the thumb hole. The fingertip grip is for more experienced bowlers. This is the grip that allows you to generate more ball rotation at the release and create hook. The ring and middle fingers are inserted in the holes up to the first joint. The thumb goes fully into the thumb hole. I use a relaxed fingertip. Uh, 
the difference between a relaxed fingertip and a full fingertip is in a full fingertip grip you're completely um, maximizing your hand potential. The relaxed fingertip, your hand is just like it says, relaxed in the bowling ball. This way you have more control and I find it more beneficial for a player with a very small hand or for a woman. There are some people that uh, go right to the next grip, which is the fingertip grip. Uh, this is the grip that you go right down to the first joint. Used by most professionals in the world today and also the better players. You get a tremendous amount of turn with this grip with less effort. Um, it does take a little bit of practice though when you're going from conventional to fingertip. Um, I do recommend this for uh, if you want to score the high, you know, be, be the bowler that you can be uh, because you do generate a lot more power with this particular grip and it's a lot more flexible. You can do a lot of different things with the drillings to create the roll, make the roll go higher or lower or get a little more side turn, a little more forward roll. Uh, and if it's drilled properly, it can be very comfortable. Whatever grip you choose, you'll need to have a pro shop operator drill your ball properly to match your grip and the way you release the ball. Also, you might want to try finger inserts for a more secure and more comfortable grip. As you progress as a player, you may want to change from a conventional grip to a fingertip grip. Talk to the people in your pro shop about your options. Of all the steps you can take to become a better bowler, none are more important than the four or five steps you take on the approach to the foul line. Let's look first at the four-step approach. To determine your starting position with the four-step approach, you simply start from the foul line and take four natural walking steps and a half step back toward the dots. Turn, and you have found what should be the right starting position. Let's look at the approach in slow motion. It begins with the proper stance, knees slightly bent, your back tilted forward at a slight angle. At this point, you are looking at your target, usually one of the arrows 15 feet down the lane or the pins themselves. For a right-handed bowler, the first step is with the right foot. For left-handed bowlers, the left. As the heel leaves the floor, the push away begins and is completed by the end of the first step. With the second step in the four step approach, the ball reaches about the halfway point of the bowler's backswing. At the third step, the ball reaches the top of the backswing, usually about shoulder height, and begins its forward motion. Some people refer to this as the power step. The fourth step ends in a slide with knees bent as the ball comes forward and is released. At this point, it is important to keep good balance by keeping your head lined up over the sliding foot. And of course, a good follow through is also essential. Let's look at the four step approach again. First step, second step, third step, slide and follow through. Again, first step, Second step, third step, slide and follow through. The four step approach is favored by many recreational and league bowlers as well as some pros. If this is the approach you find most comfortable, practice it over and over until it feels completely natural. The object here is consistency. The same approach repeated the same way every time so you really don't have to think about it. Now let's look at another commonly used approach, one that many bowlers feel gives them a more fluid motion and a greater momentum as the ball is released, the five-step approach. As with the four-step approach, you begin the five-step by determining your starting position. Take five normal walking steps and a half step back toward the dots. Turn and you have found your starting position for the five-step approach. Now let's look at the five-step approach in slow motion. Proper stance, looking at the aiming point. Now here is where the extra step comes in right at the beginning. The five step begins with a normal step, with the left foot for a right-handed bowler and the right foot for a left-hander. Notice that the push away does not begin with this first step. After this first step, the five step approach is identical to the four step. Second step with a push away. Third step 
the ball in mid back swing. Fourth step, top of the back swing. Fifth step, slide, release, and follow through. Let's have another look at the five step approach. First step, second step, third step, fourth step, slide and follow through. Again, first step, second step, third step, fourth step, slide and follow through. Remember that the five step approach begins with the foot opposite your bowling hand. Left foot for right handed bowlers, right foot for left handed bowlers. And your push away of the ball does not begin until the second step. As with the fourth step, you'll want to practice this approach over and over again until it becomes second nature. The approach is a very personal thing. Everybody develops their own style. If you watch the pro bowlers on TV on Saturday afternoons, uh, you will see a wide diversity of different styles, and there's nothing wrong with that. What you will find, though, are that there are some key issues, and the biggest one is that they are in good time. They're never uh, uh, very late with their push away or real early with their push away, or when they get to the foul line, they're very solid. The ball's coming through as they're finishing their slide, and they're in the right positions. They may do some strange things to get to that spot, but they all have that one thing in common, and that's they're solid at the foul line. That the average bowler tends to slide straight or to slightly to the left if you're right-handed. And what that happens is with the bowling ball pulling through, they fall off to the right. Now the correct way to do it would be as, as the slide starts to hit the approach, you want to slide slightly to the right if you're right-handed. That way it keeps all the weight behind you, it keeps all the weight in the center of your body, and your slide foot will end up directly underneath your chin. One of the benefits that I found uh, by going to a five-step approach is it helps to increase your ball speed. This is something that I had to do uh, for the drier lane conditions on the women's tour, or a lot of times you'll find in just league play as, as the lanes break down, you'll want to try to increase your ball speed. It's a good idea maybe to try a five-step approach. You move back on the approach, you start with the other foot, it'll help you gain momentum, get the ball going a little bit faster. You'll see a lot of things that are a little different from the four and five step approaches we have described. Of course, our bodies are different, but for most of us, one of these two approaches will give us a smooth, consistent delivery that is essential to a good score. The Isla, one of the most common things people do is when they push the arm swing out and bring it back, they bring it back in the middle of the back come around their hip line and follow through in this manner, which causes them to pull the ball away from their spot. We like to suggest to them when they push the ball out, come back in a straight arm swing, come through in a straight arm swing, follow through straight, which creates a better follow through, more accuracy, more consistency to the pocket. Okay, why don't you demonstrate that for us? All right, Dick. Okay. An essential component of your delivery is a consistently straight arm swing, like a pendulum on a clock. A straight arm swing will keep you from pulling the ball to the left or pushing it to the right. To help assure a proper arm swing, be sure that you hold the ball to the side of your body as you begin your approach. Don't hold the ball in the middle of your body. Now, as you push the ball away from your body, push it in the direction you want the ball to travel when it is released. Your arm should swing clear of your hip in a nice straight arc. Keep your arm relaxed, allowing gravity to do most of the work. Watch one more time. Proper stance. Push away. Back swing. And a nice smooth delivery. Practice it until it feels totally natural, so you'll do it correctly every time. Many recreational and league bowlers want to learn to throw a hook but they get frustrated and give up too soon. If you want the strikes that hooking the ball can help provide, you'll want to work on this important technique. The secret to throwing a hook is in your release. Before you try to learn to throw a hook, master the fundamentals of your approach and your arm swing to ensure that you can deliver the ball accurately. Having accomplished this, you will want to learn how to hook the ball to increase your strike potential. The angle at which a hooking ball enters the pocket and the power that is developed 
as the ball grips the lane on the back end combine to reduce ball deflection and increase pin carry. While many other factors, such as oil on the lanes and speed of the ball, affect hook, you must release the ball properly to create hook. To do this, you want to rotate your hand counterclockwise as you release the ball, causing the ball to rotate and then hook as it grips the lane on the back end. Watch it again. The ball is rotated counterclockwise as it is released. For a left-hander, rotation would be clockwise. Let's look at it a few more times. The hand is used to rotate the ball right at the moment of release. The arm swing does not change, only the action of the hand and wrist. As they deliver the ball, some players find themselves reversing the rotation of the ball. These so-called backup balls do indeed hook, and there's nothing wrong with this release for a recreational or league bowler. If you throw a backup ball, just make sure you use it to its full potential by throwing from the opposite side of the lane and attacking the pins like a left-hander would, or vice versa if you're a left-hander. You see a lot more women throw backup balls than you do men. Uh, I know firsthand that when I started bowling, I started throwing a backup ball. And it wasn't until I was into bowling for a year or two that I started to actually try to hook the ball. And it was something that did not come natural. I know throwing a backup ball was very natural for me to do. So I really empathize with many women that try and try and try to start hooking the ball and they get very frustrated because they can't. I have to believe it's something in the way our arms are, are made and the difference between a man and a woman's arm. That or else it's the physical strength that a man can just overpower the ball going counterclockwise versus going clockwise. Probably the, the, the main reason why you want to throw a hook is the, the great difference in pin action. Straight ball uh, is usually what an average uh, the beginning bowler usually learns because you know it's easiest to throw, and uh, but you're not going to throw a lot of strikes that way. You have to be very very accurate, uh, and the reason why the best bowlers in the world throw a hook is the tremendous pin action they get caused by the hook angle the ball makes on the back end of the lane, and uh, it's probably the most misunderstood part of bowling on, a, on exactly how to throw a hook, but the benefits are tremendous. You don't have to be as accurate. Uh, you can per se, open the lane up, and uh, the pins just fly everywhere. The release, very much like the approach, is very personal. It, uh, b based on your body size, how tall you are, how long your arm is, how muscular or lack of muscle that you might have, uh, you're going to develop your own style. It's, you know, you want to try to generate some power in the release, but today's balls will generate a lot of that power. So it's most important that you get a release that's comfortable, that doesn't tear up your hand, and that you can do consistently from week to week. Oil dressings on the lanes have a tremendous effect on the ball's motion down the lane. Yet even many experienced bowlers bowl as if the oil wasn't there. Understanding the effects of oil is key to hitting the pocket more often. Oil lane dressings are applied to protect the lane surface from the repeated battering it gets from bowling balls. The lane is oiled from the foul line to a distance of about 30 to 40 feet down the lane. Typically, the oil is applied more heavily in the center of the lane. But a number of factors, including how much the lane has been used since it was oiled, will gradually change your oil distribution. The effect of the oil on the way the ball rolls, especially the amount of hook, will change with the changing oil pattern. The fundamental thing you need to remember is that where there is oil on the lane, your ball will tend to skid and go straight, like a tire skidding on ice. Where the lane is dry, the ball gains traction and starts to hook. Knowing this, you will be able to observe various ball reactions and learn to adjust your shots accordingly. The proprietor of the bowling centers oil the lanes to protect the surface. Both wood and synthetic lanes would show tremendous wear and tear if there wasn't oil there to protect it. A general practice for most proprietors, they'll tend to oil their lanes in the late afternoon, preparing themselves for their 6.30 league. And um, as you know, if you bowl an early league, the ball will tend to skid much further than if you bowl late at night. And the reason is they've put fresh conditioner on the lane. And as the league bowls, the oil tends to dissipate from the lanes. It also tends to travel from the front part of the lane to the back. So as you bowl, 
the, la the ball will start hooking more. And conversely, if you bowl in a later league, okay, your ball will tend to hook much more than it did at 630. Oil can really be an asset to a player. The way a lane is conditioned and the way the oil line is set up can determine how easy it is to get to the pocket. If there's an oil line, say, right around 10 board, that's where the oil is the heaviest, then you can play right outside the 10 board, and the, it almost acts as just a tunnel right into the pocket. Another way to use oil to your advantage is to move in a little bit and try to project the ball out into the dry area and find the best possible break point. These are ways that will help you get to the pocket with better striking accuracy. If you're a league bowler, it's important to know that there is oil in the lanes and that it will break down during the course of the three games. So watch your ball reaction and make the appropriate adjustments to stay in the pocket for all three games. If you feel that you're delivering the ball properly, but you're still not hitting the pocket, chances are you need to adjust your strike line, not your technique. Hitting the pocket may be as simple as adjusting your strike line a few boards to the left or to the right. Under certain lane conditions, you may find that your usual well-delivered strike shots are hooking high into the head pin. Before you start altering your release and worrying that you have lost your touch, try this. Move your starting position on the approach a couple of boards to the left. Yes, left. With a hooking ball that goes too far left on the back end, you adjust your starting position to the left. You must also adjust your target in the same direction, though generally not as much. For example, if you adjust your feet two to three boards in one direction, you will probably need to adjust your target only about one board in the same direction. If you move your starting position only one board, you may not have to change your target at all. You may have to adjust several times to find the right combination of adjustments. When the ball is hitting light on the head pin too far to the right, your adjustment will be made to the right. Continue to make these adjustments until you have found the appropriate strike line for the lane conditions. Remember too, if you are a left-handed bowler, your adjustments will be reversed. To the right if you're hitting high, left if you're hitting light. It's best to try to locate your strike line before you start your game, but as lane conditions continue to change, you may have to adjust your strike line again. As far as uh, adjusting to the lanes and finding your strike line, uh, if, you're, if the ball is hooking too much and you're going Brooklyn or you're hitting the nose a lot, uh, you want to move your feet to the left. And uh, if you continue to do it, you want to move your feet, make an adju another adjustment to the left until you hit the pocket. Um, and then conversely, if the ball isn't coming up to the head pin and you're hitting the three pin in the face for a right-handed bowler, you'd want to move your feet to the right. And uh, a lot of times, the amateurs make this mistake is they'll move once and they won't move anymore. You move until. You also can move your target as well. In other words, if the ball is going too far left, move your target to the right. If the ball is going too far to the right, move your target to the left. I think it's more important for a woman to be accurate than it is for a man. A man can overcome his lack of accuracy by his power, whereas a woman does not have the amount of power that the man has. So a woman actually has to be more accurate, hit the same area of the lane time and time again in order to, to hit the pocket over and over again. I always teach to what we call spot bowl, which is to aim at the dots or the arrows or the boards between the arrows. Uh, personally, I aim at the arrows, which are about between 15 and 17 feet down the lane, and I think it's much easier to hit a target at that distance than the pins, which are 60 feet away. So I always recommend spot bowling. If you're like most players, you spend a lot of time practicing how to make strikes. That's important. But when you consider the fact that you can score 190 in a game without making any strikes, you can understand why practicing your spares is so essential. First, let's look at some of the spares that intimidate many bowlers unnecessarily. With only the 10 pin left standing, many right-handed bowlers move to the right and attempt to convert the 10 pin by rolling the ball straight down the edge of the lane. At that angle, you don't have much room for error. To shoot this spare with more room for error, 
You should make your shot diagonally across the lane. Whether you're right-handed or left-handed, you should be shooting this spare from the left side of the lane. Let's look again. By going across the lane, you increase the amount of lane available to make your shot. Not having to worry about that gutter gives you more confidence so you can convert this spare. Now let's look at making your spare with only the seven pin standing. Again, the right way to convert this spare is to go across the lane. Both right-handed and left-handed bowlers should set the ball down on the right side of the lane and angle the ball across the lane to the left side. The seven pin spare and the 10 pin spare are very common. Using a cross lane strategy will help you make these spares more often and improve your score. Steve, we both know how important spares are. Just how much room do we have on the lane to make spares? Well, it's funny, Dick, when you stand on the approach and you look down the lane, that single pin spare seems so small at the other end of the lane. But in reality, we really have a lot of room to make that spare. So let me show you exactly what we have here. Here we have this ball on the left striking the pin. And here we have on the right this ball striking the pin. I've placed a piece of tape under the center of the ball to show exactly how much room we have to make this spare. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen boards to make a single pin spare in the center of the lane. Now let's say we left either the seven or the ten on one side or the other. We'll do the ten pin for example. If you go to the other end you'll find that there's one board on the outside. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine boards in order to make this 10 pin. The opposite would be true for the seven pin. So we really have a lot more room to make this spare than we would originally believe. Thanks very much, Steve. I think that's a very important tip so we can go out and practice for the uh, five pin, the 10 pin, the seven pin, or whatever spare we have up there. We have plenty of room to make it. Sure do. Another common spare is a three, six, 10, which is the two, four, seven for left-handers. The best strategy for making the spare is to shoot cross lane between the three and six or the two and four if you are left-hander. Watch again, the ball is angled across the lane taking out the three, six, and 10 pins. With most spares, you'll want to use a straight shot into your target area. An exception, however, is a difficult bucket. The two, four, five, eight for right-handers, the three, five, six, nine for left-handers. The simplest strategy is to use your strike shot, but adjust your starting point a few boards. Right for right-handers, left for left-handers. This should allow you to angle the ball into the 2-5 or the 3-5 for a left-hander. With sufficient angle to carry all four pins, too light a shot on a spare is likely to leave the back pin standing. From a woman's standpoint, spare shooting is very critical. A man can get away with missing a spare or two per game because he has a tendency to throw more strikes. He has more power to do so. A woman, on the other hand, has to increase her average by shooting spares. So it's very important for her to learn how to pick up all her spares. Let your ball be your guide. Watch the spares that you leave because they will tell you the adjustments you need to make to throw strikes. For example, if you're leaving a lot of 10 pins, you want to move slightly to the right on the approach. Most of the time, that will remedy the problem. And conversely, if you're leaving a lot of four pins, try moving a little left to the approach. You'll find that uh, you'll have a tendency to kick the four pin out. So spares are certainly the most important aspect of bowling as you're learning how to bowl. Later on, as you try to get to be over 180, 190 average a bowler, then it's time to start really concentrating on the strikes. But until you get to that level, spares are the key ingredient to becoming as good as you can. If you're really serious about becoming a better bowler, you're going to have to practice without worrying about your score. For example, going for those strikes in a game won't help you practice your spares. If you're really serious about becoming a better bowler, you're going to have to practice without worrying about your score. You might want to try Steve Wunderlich's practice strategy of shooting the 10 pin first and then using your strike shot on the remaining pins. This little exercise will help you develop the accuracy you need for shooting spares. One of the best ways to practice making spares is that when you go in to do open play or practice, shoot your first ball at a spare that you're having difficulty with. If you've been having a difficult time with the 10-pin, throw your first ball at the 10-pin and then throw your strike ball. 
That way you'll get t two shots every frame. You'll get more for your money. And after two or three games of doing that, you'll be very comfortable the next time you leave a 10 pin. Probably the easiest way to practice. And uh, I think we've lost the art of this a little bit uh, because there's so much emphasis on throwing nothing but strikes. Uh, I see more and more people just pushing the reset button when they leave their spares. Um, for the average bowler who doesn't have time to bowl 20 games a day uh, and you have maybe two or three games to practice during the day or maybe t two or three times a week, the goal is to get the most out of your practice. And a real easy drill would be shoot your spares on your first ball. Shoot your corner pins, the 7 or the 10 pin, or shoot the, the 3 six, 10 spare or the 2 four, 5 spare on your first ball and then come back and shoot what's left. Uh, we used to play a game called low ball and um, where uh, the object is to hit one or two pins every ball and this way we became very sharp and we got a lot of practice in a little in a small amount of time. I think when I go to practice I have a tendency uh, to practice a lot of spares. I want to see my ball reaction uh, towards my spares. I'll also practice uh, for repetition, timing, making sure I do the same thing every time. This is really something that am amateurs can do as well. Practice the spares and practice their timing. Well, practice is the most important part of bowling as far as improving goes. And the element that has worked the best for me over the years is to for sure not keep score. Keeping score is a distraction because you're worried about how many pins you're knocking down instead of improving some aspect of your game. So if I could give everybody one piece of advice, it would be don't keep score when you practice. Every time you go into a practice session, try to identify one thing you need to work on. Your approach, your arm swing, your release. You may not knock down a lot of pins when you're practicing, but you'll see a big difference when it counts. Taking care of your bowling balls is very important and the worst thing you can do is leave them in your trunk during extreme heat or cold. Uh, plastic does not like either extreme and all bowling balls have plastic materials in them so it's not a good idea to leave them in your trunk. Another reason not to leave them in your trunk is that they get cold then they will sweat when you bring them inside and you will have trouble releasing them consistently until they are brought up to room temperature. As far as cleaning your bowling ball uh, never use any solvents. The safest way to clean your ball today is, uh, is regular alcohol. Alcohol in a towel, right before you bowl league, clean all the dirt off, and away you go. My husband is constantly telling me, get the bowling balls out of the garage. Uh, this is something that I really shouldn't do. I should bring them all in the house, keep them warm, take good care of them, keep them clean, because uh, like any other sporting equipment, it can damage your equipment when it hits uh, those sub-zero temperatures outside. One of the great things about bowling is that it's not a very expensive sport to get into. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't take good care of your equipment. Here are a few tips. Remember that extreme heat or cold is very hard on your bowling ball. So don't leave it in your car trunk during summer or winter months. Make sure you keep the sole of your sliding shoe clean so your slide will be consistent shot after shot. Have the appropriate accessories available when you go show up to bowl. A clean towel, skin patch to protect your hand, bowler's tape to adjust your thumb hole, and a rosin bag to keep your hands dry. Finally, don't be afraid to try a wrist device or a glove. There are many good ones on the market and they have helped many people improve their game. When you bowl for a big championship, you usually play in front of a nice quiet gallery, just like in a golf match. Concentrating on your shot comes a little easier, but most times at the bowling center, you're going to deal with a lot of distraction. People on the other lanes, your fellow league bowlers, the general noise level of a busy center. Still, you should work hard to develop the ability to concentrate for the few seconds it takes to set up and make your delivery. As far as concentration when you're competing, the best thing to do is not to look at the score, either your score or the opponent's score, because uh, your opponent's score doesn't really mean much, does it? If you perform at the level, at your best level, um, you have a better chance of winning the match. 
And we'll also, uh, I think, uh, when you tend to look at the, uh, your opponent's score, you tend to pace with him, and you tend to squeeze, and you tend to tense up. Whereas if you're just kind of into your own little world, you really don't know what's going on around you, and automatically your concentration gets better. One of the most difficult situations to be in is bowling league and trying to concentrate. You're really wanting to socialize with the other members of the team and walking around, but one thing I've done is the minute I step up on the approach or just in front of the approach, before I pick up my ball, I put myself in a bubble and I start focusing on what I want to do and uh, what the results I want. Then I get up on the approach, I take a deep breath, and I go from there. But it's very, very important when you're bowling league to try to remove yourself from that social situation. Concentration is developed by repetitive shot making. And one of the best ways to do that is to make sure you see the ball roll over your target time after time. If you do this when you're practicing, you'll find that you will create the habit and thus do it in competition and you won't notice the things that are happening in the bowling environment near as often. Many people are distracted by loud noises or other bowlers running up beside them, but if your concentration is such that you're only seeing your target and nothing else, then uh, you'll find that those things no longer bother you. Concentration will help you make more strikes and spares, and making those shots will build your confidence level frame by frame. Concentration, confidence, it's a winning combination. You've just seen and heard some things we all have to remember if we're going to bowl our best. But you'll notice that even among professional bowlers, not everyone does exactly the same thing. Personal style always plays a role. And Del, you have some thoughts along those lines. As long as you have the fundamentals, uh, people tend to develop their own style. And as, as I've seen over the years, and so have you, Dick, uh, there's many different great bowlers with, from high back swings to low to medium speed to hard to very slow and uh, to a lot of revolutions, to a lot of hook, to throwing the ball very straight. So uh, you can be very successful at all levels and uh, while still developing your own style. The best example of that is you and your son. Uh, obviously you took your son, you taught him the basic fundamentals, but then you let him go with what came naturally to him and it really shows in the difference in your two styles. You've both won more than 20 PBA national championships, and yet their styles are totally different. So uh, good fundamentals are important, and yet you can let your own, uh, what comes naturally, be a big impact. I think a good tip would be uh, just to remain open-minded to the changes and to be able to, to take a four-step or a five-step if you need to or, or be willing to change. Uh, the game has changed so much, as you well know, Dick, over the years. I'm sure you've had to change your game a time or two. And I think just being open-minded to make changes in your game can really help a player. Well, that's for sure. I, I believe in experimentation any time, and st still do. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned styles, and uh, watching all of us bowl, we have so many different styles with the same delivery, five-step delivery, and, and it's amazing. And, of course, uh, you have to change with the eras as we go along. Speaking of style, Steve, you know, you, when you and I were on the tour, uh, I think we were known as uh, one of the couple of the more practice pros on the tour. We did a tremendous amount of practicing. Uh, why did you practice so much? Well, my, my game does not come as naturally as some of the pros out there, so I had to practice a lot and generate repetition in my game. Uh, you know, like you said, you and I and Dave Ozio and a few of the others really put in lots and lots of hours so that we don't have to think about anything. It just becomes so natural do, through repetition where uh, somebody like Petey or somebody has more natural ability and they have our uh, Amaletto Monticelli the same way where they, they just kind of flow up to the line. My game is much more physical than that, and I'd have to practice to create repetition. And yeah, we had bowlers like that in the old days, too. You know, some of them had to practice 8, 10, 12 hours at a time before a tournament each day. And uh, some of us just uh, maybe went through three or four games because we could feel what we're doing. And that's what one of our tips were. You've got to feel or try to feel what you're doing out there with your four-step or five-step delivery. 
Well, you know, I, I know a real nice key that uh, amateurs have told me across the country and that they, they said, I really enjoy watching the, w the women professionals because they have such great fundamentals, great basics, and this is something that I can relate to more so than trying to watch some of the male pros because they are so powerful. You know, they really do hook the ball quite a bit more than a, a lot of uh, recreational bowlers do. So they have a tendency to enjoy watching the women and able to relate to them. Mm -hmm. And, they, and they're, they're so solid. I know Steve has mentioned it many times that how the women are solid and balanced at the foul line compared to a lot of men, especially like myself, I always fall off to the right. And I know sometimes you have a tendency to fall off to your right too, Steve. Sure. I think the, uh, the fact that the ladies are not as big and strong, they have to be better than us. And uh, I think if when I do my coaching, I always recommend that the amateurs look at the ladies tour to see the good fundamentals. They usually have better timing, better balance at the foul line. You know, you, like Dell was saying, the men uh, have many different styles, and a lot of them, to be honest, aren't as good fundamentally as the women. They seem to always be in, in kind of prettier to watch. They have that really good timing, and uh, so they're, it's a good teaching habit to, to watch the ladies. What do you think has been the, like the major change? I mean, I've, I've seen some tremendous changes just in the last 15 years that I've been involved with professional bowling. I mean, over five decades, I mean, you've, you've seen some tremendous changes. What do you, what do you think is... The biggest. Well, you know, we go back to the uh, to the 50s, the 40s, and 50s, and we had uh, hard rubber bowling balls then. And then we went to plastic bowling balls, and then urethane bowling balls, soft rubber bowling balls. Now we're in the uh, era of reactive resin, which really is a great help to me because it gives me a little more back end, a little more hook on the back end. And I think uh, Lee Isle and I really look forward to that because we're more or less the straight shooters down the boards, let the ball hook in maybe four or five boards at the pocket where you two fellas uh, really uh, hooked the ball nicely. So it's, it's a blessing to me to see uh, reactive lesson, uh, resin. And uh, even I, I go back to the year thing sometimes too, according to the uh, conditions of the lanes. I, I want to thank you very much for your input. I'm sure it's going to be a great help to our recreational league bowlers. And thank you again. Thanks, Dick, Appreciate for having it. us. Okay. Thanks Good for having night. me. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. And there you have it, another important tip. Work on the fundamentals, but don't try to bowl exactly like someone else. Doing what comes naturally will help you become a better bowler. Well, chances are, you're already doing a lot of things I've suggested perfectly well. But take my word for it. We all have things we can do to improve our games. If you're strong in some areas, but weak in others, concentrate on just one of those weak areas at a time. In just a short time, you'll start seeing improvement in your score. Let me close with one more tip, a very personal one. Bowling has been my work for almost five decades, but it's also been my play. I've been luckier than most people in being able to combine the two. But for most of you out there, bowling shouldn't be work. It should be fun. And improving your game is a way to make bowling even more fun. You may not always beat your average or clobber the other team, but if you're having fun, I promise you this game will never get old. Coming up, highlights from Dick Weber's five decades as a professional bowler. Don't miss these great moments of the world's greatest bowler in action. Back when I was a kid, Dick Weber was the star in bowling, and even more so in the St. Louis area where I grew up. And uh, it's really been an incredible pleasure for me to... Uh, go through the different levels that I've gone with Dick. First as a kid, uh, bowling in junior archway tournaments with him and uh, getting to know him. Then as I, my career went forward, I actually got to bowl against him on the national tour and there's probably no bigger thrill in my lifetime than the first time I actually got to cross on the same lanes with Dick Weber, bowl 18 games of qualifying. Even though it wasn't the first tournament I ever bowled on the big tour, it was a tremendous thrill. I was nervous the whole time. Not only have I had the great opportunity to bowl with or against Dick Weber, but I've also had the opportunity to be with him on different levels. Uh, when I was in college, I worked for Dick Weber. Like any other college kid trying to make it through school, uh, I needed some extra money, so I worked at a bowling center, which is no big surprise. And uh, Dick was my boss. It was his center, and uh, I worked uh, three nights a week for Dick, and, and that was an interesting experience as well. I now have Dick Weber working for me. Well, 
actually it's with me, but uh, I'm in charge of the, the staff of champions, and uh, Dick Weber certainly is, is our biggest one of those. And so it's been a great honor to work with Dick doing these videos and uh, many of the other things that go along with the AMF staff of champions. In this video, you will see some of the highlights of Dick's five decades of bowling. The first one is the 1956 All-Star, where he bowls one of his biggest challengers and one of the other true greats of the game, Don Carter. To the finals of the 16th annual All-Stars Tournament, direct from the Coliseum in Chicago. And here is Dick Weber. Dick Weber with his special thumb guard, which Pete Trinasty gave him three All-Stars ago at this site in the Coliseum, and which he has now made into a thriving business, and which almost every bowler in this tournament has worn toward the closing stages of this 100-game grind. This is the 98th game in nine days on two. That's it, boy, oh, and Dick Weber isn't out yet. Battling against his teammate on the Budweiser's, and herein lies a tremendous story, too, as these two men, teammates on the Bud's team out of St. Louis, the national five-man champions, perhaps, and one of the greatest teams ever assembled in the history of bowling. This is it, the National Individual Match Game Championships, and this is Don Carter, two-time winner. Let's take a good look at him. We may see history set tonight. And here is Dick Weber. Their totals have come very close to the greatest total ever assembled in sanctioned bowling, that of the Herman Undertakers. Dick on one. That's it, boy. In this next video, Dick takes on another one of his big time challengers, Billy Waylu. This is the 1963 All-Star and it was his second of four All-Star victories. The All-Star is considered by many to be the toughest tournament of all times to win because it takes 100 games to get to the end. Welcome to the $100,000 World Series of Bowling, the final games of the 22nd Annual All-Star Tournament of the Bowling Proprietors Association of America. And into the big one here, $15,000 to the winner, $8,000 to the runner-up. The defending champion, Dick Weber, would like to make it two in a row to become the third man to repeat. Weber opened with 233. Waylu had 205. We are through six frames. Weber is 95 strike in the sixth. Waylu is 88 strike in the sixth. The margin is 28 pins. Weber is out in front. Dick is on the left side. These lanes have never been tested by these two boys. They're neutral lanes. He's thin. He carries all but the five pin. It's a life for Billy Waylu. A big fella, six feet, four inches. Set an all-time high in the qualifying rounds. He averaged 225 for the 36 games. There's the seven pin as Billy to carry his shaker. Well, there's one he can work on, a strike in the eighth. However, Weber will set a new record for the finals. It'll be right around 221. His average for the entire tournament of 95 games will be around 221. And the five pin stands as Weber settles for 205. Waylu now, the final ball in the 10th frame, and this will be the final of the 10,765th game, and that's it. 10,765 games have been bowled in this, the 22nd annual All-Star Bowling Tournament. We'll be back to interview the winners, Marion Ledewick and Dick Weber, in just a moment. In the 60s, another great bowling show, Championship Bowling, developed. And in this segment, we'll see Dick Weber take on Carmen Salvino, one of the most colorful bowlers of all time. Needing 696 to make the finals. The All-American from St. Louis, Dick Weber. From Chicago, Illinois, needing 675 to make the finals. Carmen Salvino. Dick Weber. 
two-time national individual match game champion. One of three men to win that title two years in a row, joining the great Andy Burra Papa and Don Carter. Dick Weber, an All-American on any man's bowling team. At the seven, he covers the spread. <laughs> Carmen cocks that wrist, little finger on top of the ball, throw too tight again, and he got away with one. The four seven out of there. Whoever left a seven pin in the first frame came back with a strike, then he was too high. Left the six pin, he's been in the pocket ever since. One more. There it is. All the way home. All the way home for Dick Weber, one of the real great champions. They call him the cracker, the splinter, the thin man from St. Louis. One of the most significant victories in Dick's career was the 1976 AMF Pro Classic, where he came against one of the new gunslingers on the tour, Earl Anthony. This is just two of the great players. You just can't even pick. It's just a, a Couldn't have a better final than this. Without a doubt. This is Earl Anthony. Off to a shaky start. Nick Weber on 22. Now, that's a, that's a very important strike for a lot of reasons, Bo. It's almost immaterial to count here, Dave. Dick Weber with strike 218. Seven pins is just as good. Would give him 215 because it forces Earl Anthony to get at least two strikes. Earl's going to need two strikes no matter what Weber does. 216. Last ball, the most important ball. Dick Weber there. Earl going wide head. on that shot. Dick Weber is the winner. Dick Weber, the winner, and now a record winner. 25 tournaments. And we'll be right back with the close after this. In the 80s, Dick Weber continued his winning ways by winning five PBA seniors tournaments. Weber quickly up to the line. And does he get the message? Yes! has been his week all week long as Dick Weber led this tournament by 506 pins and there's one of the reasons why. That was the head pin. Comes all the way across the lane and gets the 10, no doubt. In talking with Dick, he has never led a tournament by more than he did this one this week. And I don't think he's ever bowled any better than he did this week. Well, when you average 231 for 36 games, you're doing something right. At age 56. Amazing, isn't it? Zykes never put any pressure on him. And Weber got his wish. He didn't have to bowl Spezio, who probably would have bowled a little higher score. Dick Weber, a $100,000 showboat senior invitational champion, and gets a rousing round of applause. In 1992, at the age of 62, Dick Weber became the first professional bowler ever to win in five different decades. Let's take a look at him winning the PBA Seniors Touring Player Doubles with Justin Romack. Never before in the history of the Professional Bowlers Association has a player won a national PBA title in five consecutive decades. But tonight, the great Dick Weber, with a victory in the championship match, would set a brand new PBA standard. Well, the big story tonight, you know, is if Dick Weber wins tonight, he will have won in five different decades. The 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and now we're in the 90s. I know it's important to him. I think it's important to the whole bowling world, and everybody is watching with anticipation to see if Weber can pull it off. The Weber and Romick are in a commanding position right now. Double here, and it's good night. Spare, and they're awful good shape. He got a handful. Hey, oh, all right, Weber. On, right here, right here, right here. Right here, right here guys. Just a quick peek at the incredible record of Dick Weber, and very close to notching yet another. What do you He's say? The winner in five. Yeah, days. all right, all right out there, partner. Way to go out there. Get it. One more out there.
It was a team effort. Weber got two key strikes, both for doubles. Five decades. He's thrown a lot of key strikes through the years, and it pays off tonight. Romick finishes things off with a solid nine, but it doesn't make any difference. Dick Weber, a winner here near his hometown of St. Louis. Big game for the team of Romick and Dick Weber as they capture the doubles. And Bill Magella, the tournament director, you have a, a check and a trophy. Dick and Justin, on behalf of St. Clair Bowl, it's my privilege to congratulate Justin, you on your first PBA title. And Dick, I'd like to be the first to congratulate you on being the first man to win five titles in five different decades. Thank you. Congratulations. I'm glad you're you. here. I believe Dick Weber to be the greatest bowler of all times, but it's not because of his singular accomplishments, the fact that he was bowler of the year on four different occasions, or that he was recognized as the greatest athlete in America two different times, or the fact that he's in the PBA and the ABC Hall of Fame. What separates Dick from the rest is the fact that he's done it for five decades. He beat Don Carter, Carmen Salvino, Marshall Holman, Mark Roth, Earl Anthony, and even today's kids. He's beat those guys in their prime, and he's still doing it today. This is what makes Dick truly the greatest bowler of all time.